Okay, so today we're going to finish discussing primitive Christianity, the early centuries, uh, in our discussion of Christian heresies, or ways of thinking about Jesus, uh, interpretations early Christians came up with that were ultimately rejected by the triumphant church. So we've already talked about various approaches to early questions that emerged when Greeks and Romans started becoming Christians. Marcion uh, had them confront basically what do you do with the old Jewish tradition, and that's why it's an Old Testament now for Christians. And then the Monophysites and the Arians were both uh, squabbling over how we define the divinity of Jesus. Remember that Christianity among world religions today is unique. Uh, unlike Judaism and Islam and Buddhism and Taoism, which all have a founder who is enlightened but was still mortal, Christianity holds the belief that their founder was divine himself. And that is going to be the starting point for a whole lot of uh, difficult theological exploration. Okay? So today we have one more to look at. There's a dozen others we'll have to uh, skip, but we have one more to look at today. Uh, one of the most fascinating groups of ancient uh, heretics. And they don't come up in the Nicene Creed because they really weren't on the Roman radar yet. They become controversial later in the fourth century after Constantine is dead and the church is being established. This was the new big challenge uh, that emerged uh, in, in intellectual Christian circles. And it's a group called the Gnostics. This is a, a brand of thought called Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Gnostics are people who believe they have secret knowledge about where the world really came from and what's really going on around us, which is not what most people really think. Now, Gnosticism as a worldview is different than anything we've looked at yet in class. So far in class, we have talked about polytheism, such as most ancient pagans practice. We talked about enotheism, which is really what describes the early Hebrews. They didn't disbelieve the existence of other gods in the early days. They thought they were real. Uh, obviously, their god is a jealous god. He's jealous of other gods. They simply only worship one out of the many gods. They had this exclusive brain of worship. And both of these groups eventually evolve into monotheism. The belief that there is really just one god behind the things of the universe. Well, there is one more option that we've yet to explore. Beyond the idea of many gods, or one among many gods, or just one god, is the belief system that says there are exactly two gods in the world. And you can probably guess what kind of gods these are. What are they gods of? Good and evil. Or we should say good versus evil. So this posits that there is a god of good and a god of evil. It's a little different than the Christian conception of the devil, who represents evil, but he's not on the status with God. The good God is the God of light. The evil God is the God of darkness. The good God is the God of truth. The evil God is the God of lies. And what's most important about all this, and really understanding their approach, is that the good God is believed to be the creator of your spirit, of the soul within you. And the evil God is believed to be the creator of flesh and the material world around us. This physical world is the creation of the evil God. And our souls are not just inhabiting a physical body, the way that most ancients would have thought about it. Our souls are trapped in this physical body. They don't want to be here. And how that comes about, we'll explore in just a minute. To back up a little bit, Gnosticism isn't exactly a religion by itself. It's more like an interpretation of reality. And Gnostics find their way into a lot of different religions because the Gnostics believe that all religions have some shadowy kernel of the truth there. There's some distant memory of the secret knowledge that they believe they have. And they find themselves going into a lot of different religions and sort of like clarifying their theology. And they come into the Roman world somewhere during the later imperial days, and their followers were called Manichees. Their founder, they remember, is someone named Manny, and Manny was originally a priest of Zoroastrianism. Anybody had the world religions class and ever encountered Zoroastrians? It is a very ancient religion. 
Uh, it still exists today. There's, I think, a few hundred thousand Zoroastrians still in the world. Uh, but it goes back to early you know, BC days. And uh, the Zoroastrian religion is the first religion to posit the idea of an apocalyptic final battle at the end of days. And Zoroastrianism has a good God and an evil God. And the idea is that you need to recruit people to the army of the good God in preparation for this final battle. And the thing that's important is that either side might win this battle. The evil God could win. You know, Christianity, nobody thinks the devil's really going to win, you know, at Judgment Day, at the Apocalypse, right? It's a foregone conclusion he's going to lose. But there are other views that thought either side could win because these gods are equally powerful. And that's what made it imperative that you join the army of the good. So this was a very early uh, dualistic religion that had two deities. And Manny, in the Gnostic interpretation that comes out of it, is essentially a more spiritual approach to the thing that essentially argues that this apocalyptic battle between good and evil isn't going to happen literally at the end of time. It's happening right now. It's happening all around us. Our lives are saturated with the results of this conflict that's going on, but most people don't know it. Most people don't see it because they don't have the knowledge that awakens them to it. So Manichaeism, as it's also called, or Gnosticism, has a relationship to Zoroastrianism, much in the same way that the mystery cults grew out of paganism, the way that Christianity grew out of Judaism. It's later a sort of more, more inward-looking version uh, of an earlier religious form. Okay. All right, so what is this secret knowledge? It's all about how the world was created, and it ultimately provides an explanation for one of those eternal wisdom questions that all religions and all philosophies have to deal with at some point. Why is there evil in the world? If God is good, why does he allow the devil to exist? If the world is good, why is there suffering in it? And it's hard to get a, a logical, rational answer out of most religions. Job suffers, as we see in the ancient wisdom literature, of uh, folktale of the Hebrew Bible. And when Job tries to figure out why he's suffering, what does God tell him? Tells him, shut the hell up. Don't question him. So you don't get an answer from Job. Right? And that's the problem. Why would a good God create a world in which a bunch of people in the end are going to go to hell and suffer forever? Why create us in the first place if that's our destiny? It's hard to rationally wrap your head around those kinds of questions. So we end up just accepting it on faith. But the Gnostics, they have an answer to this question. And the answer is not, is that. We don't have to imagine a good God somehow allowing evil. You simply have two gods. One's a god of good, the other is a god of evil. And so the good things of the world, that comes from the good God. And the evil suffering, that comes from the bad God. It's much easier to explain that one. It explains a lot of other mysteries of our lives as well. First of all, the essential story, Gnostic literature, the literature that survives, tends to be very mystical and poetic, a little hard to decipher. Uh, and there's various versions of this story. But the basic story is this. In the beginning, there's a God of good and a God of evil that are all wrapped up in their own separate worlds. And there's a conflict of some sort, and the result of which is that the evil God kind of bites off a piece of the good God and swallows up the light and traps it. And that is essentially where the world came from. The world around us is the result of this original conflict. This is the Big Bang, this is Genesis when some of the spirit got trapped in matter. And we are all the results of it. We are little bits of spirit living in a material body. And what is so bad about living in a material body? I, mean, I got up and enjoyed the nice weather this morning, and I enjoy eating burritos and drinking margaritas, and you know, there are many pleasures of life, yes? What's so bad about it? The reason it's evil is that ultimately, it is only because you are in a material body that you experience suffering in your life. Think about it. If your soul was free and disembodied, floating around up in the ether, you could never feel hunger or pain. No one could insult you. You couldn't get mugged. You wouldn't desire things you can't have. You would just be all blissful, floating in the spirit realm. Isn't that what we all look forward to at the end of our lives? We get to be blissful and float around, yeah? In some heavenly bliss. But because we're in a body, we suffer. Every living creature that has ever existed 
has had suffering and pain in their lives. What kind of a God makes a world in which every living creature suffers? That's not a good God, according to the Gnostics. That's only an evil God that would do such a thing. When the Gnostics come into Christianity, they find a religion that they kind of like. They find the message of Jesus, who says to control your anger and your lust and all your you know, passions that just lead to suffering and criminal behavior. They agree with that. Uh, love, in a spiritual sense of being caring and compassionate, is the way that a spiritual person ought to live. They agree with that. Uh, they like Paul's writings pretty much as well. Then the Gnostics get to the Hebrew Bible, and they have the same reaction Marcion did. This angry, jealous God of the Old Testament now that commands the slaughter of whole nations of people, that's always commanding war and violence, how can that be the same God that Jesus talked about? Marcion concluded it was some other alien, ancient God, and the Gnostics agree, and they can tell you exactly what God that was. It was God of evil. So when the Gnostics come into Christianity and they kind of infiltrate certain churches, remember this is still the early days, churches are still kind of inventing things as they go along, they somehow find their way into the congregations of gatherings of Christians, and they start subtly reinterpreting and sort of shifting the emphases of some of these early writers. Uh, another important thing to remember to really fully understand what the Gnostic approach to reality is, is something that all the ancients essentially shared. In antiquity, nobody knew what your brain was for. This three pounds of gray matter between your ears, nobody understood what its function was. Uh, Aristotle thought that maybe it was like a radiator. It was a place where the blood went and cooled off before going back into the body, right? The ancient Egyptians thought so little of it that when they mummified their pharaoh, they would take out every organ and put it in a jar and preserve it, but the brain, they took something that looked like a crochet needle, jammed it up his nose, and just pulled it out in bits and tossed it. They had no idea what it was for. It didn't seem important to them. So nowadays we know that this is where our consciousness, our identity resides. All of our thoughts, all of our emotions come from here. For the ancients, not knowing what it was for, for them, it was your soul that was the origin of rational thought. Your ability and reason emanated from your rational soul. And your flesh, your material body, was where emotions came from. Especially dark, angry, violent sorts of emotions. They thought it just sort of emerged from the flesh. It was just a condition of the flesh. If you've ever been so angry that you're just shaking with rage, that would be evidence for them. Your flesh is just emanating this emotion. And we go through our lives with this conflict. Constantly, we have a conflict between what our reason tells us we ought to do, what our emotions and our passions and our feelings tell us to do. Do you not go through life with these two forces in conflict with each other? Of course you do. You know, in the days ahead, you're going to have this conflict. You're going to be thinking, I have to study for Dr. Brooks's exam. Reason will tell you, go hit the books and, and get prepared. But it's also almost spring break. And you know there's going to be keg parties. And so guys, you're thinking, hey, I could go find some fly honeys, right? I could go, you know, maybe get it on with a curvy girl. And so your passions are saying, fly honey. Your reason is saying, hit the books. What's going to win? Gotcha. Young men like you, very often your passions win. <laughs> And this is the conflict of our whole lives. And it all goes back to how it began. So in the Gnostic view of the Christian world, going back now to the Old Testament, what's the emerging Christian Bible, in the story of Genesis, they look back at the creation story of Genesis and say, guys, you've got this all backwards. You have been lied to. You've been beguiled in this story. Because the creator God of Genesis, if he's the God that made the physical world, well, that's the evil God. He made a world where everybody suffers. He's a liar about it. Every time he says he makes something, he calls it good, but it's not good. It's more material that traps and makes your spirit suffer. It begins with let there be light. He didn't create light. He trapped the light and put it in a, in a fleshy dungeon. So the whole thing is a lie. 
And the kicker of all this is that at the end of creation, he makes his prized creatures, man and woman. And he puts them in the Garden of Eden, seemingly a paradise. And what does he tell them that they should do in the Garden? That's what he tells them they should not do in the Garden. Don't eat from that tree of what? The tree of what? Good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from the tree of gnosis. You ever wondered about that? Why would God want his prized creatures to not have knowledge? Why is knowledge deemed bad? You value knowledge, don't you? You're in college getting some right now, right? So you value knowledge, and yet we've accepted this story that tells us that getting knowledge was a bad thing. Instead, what does God tell Adam and Eve to do in the garden? What are they supposed to be doing there? Be fruitful and multiply, right? So think about it. Why does a good God tell his you know, capstone creatures, the human beings, to basically stay ignorant, naked, and just fornicating in the Garden of Eden? Do you know people that are ignorant, naked fornicators? Are they, are they your favorite people? Or they live out in Redneck Town somewhere. <laughs> So yeah, ignorant, naked fornicators, that, that's actually what God tells them to do in the Garden of Eden. Now, who is it that tells Adam and Eve to go eat from that tree of knowledge? And who is the serpent? The story never says that the serpent is the devil. We've already learned from the book of Job that Satan is not that guy at all. He works for God in the early days. The Lucifer story is not actually in your Old Testament. And it never says anything other than the serpent. It really is a talking snake. And as you recall from the other early Mesopotamian stuff we do, there's lots of talking snakes in ancient uh, Middle Eastern myth. The Epic of Gilgamesh has a talking snake that steals the flower of immortality from Gilgamesh, who then has to leave the garden and die of old age like the rest of us do. So it's a talking snake. And the serpent is called, in your translations most likely, it's rendered as the serpent, the wiliest of creatures. Now, when you hear the word wily, remember, that's a translation. Your, your translator has made a decision on what term to use that has certain connotations to it. When you call somebody wily, that sounds nefarious, right? It sounds somehow wicked. But can you be stupid and be wily? No. To be wily, you've got to be smart. Right? I know wily coyote always fails at everything he does, not because he's stupid. He just, you know, the roadrunner's got amazing karma and everything works against him. But that phrase, from the original, you could just as easily translate the serpent, the wiliest of creatures, as the serpent, the wisest of creatures. It would be just as valid a translation either way. It's a judgment call that makes us all render it wily rather than wise. So the serpent is the wisest of creatures that tells these poor people that have been kept in the dark to go and get knowledge. And from the Gnostic point of view, the serpent was doing them a favor. This was a good thing. And from the Gnostic point of view, the serpent was the first incarnation of Jesus Christ. The creator God is the evil one, and the serpent is Jesus, the avatar of the God of good who did him a favor. Imagine how much this must have freaked out the bishops of the Orthodox Church <laughs> when they first started hearing what these Gnostics were preaching. It turns the whole story upside down, right? But there is something sort of compelling about it. It does kind of make sense of things. It draws attention to questions maybe we've never asked before, but once you ask them, they're actually pretty good questions. If Adam and Eve had never eaten from the tree of knowledge, they would have stayed naked, ignorant, and fornicating in the Garden of Eden. And what would have been the result of that? Just fornicating all the time, what are you going to produce? A lot of babies. A lot of babies, right? Why is that a bad thing? I was delighted at the birth of my children, but from the Gnostics, giving birth to a child is the worst thing. Because that little flesh blob might form in the womb, but what brings the child to life? It must have a soul, right? Where does that soul come from? From the heavenly realm, where soul resides. So every time a baby is born, a little bit of spirit gets sucked down into it to bring it alive, which continues the process that began at the creation. More spirit trapped in more matter, all of which is going to suffer. 
That's why a baby cries when it's first born, according to the Gnostics. A little bit of sperm is floating around in the ether, all tranquil, and suddenly it wakes up in a physical body and realizes, oh crap, 70, 80 years of suffering until I have a chance to get out of here again. So the baby cries. The Gnostics. So what they are basically arguing is that the story in Genesis is completely reversed. It's a giant lie. It is actually a process by which we began the trapping of spirit in matter, which will do nothing but cause you to suffer. And then what the lying evil God tried to do to the first couple is keep them in a state of ignorance so they would perpetuate what had already begun. More spirit trapped in more matter as the population increases. And eventually all the spirit would all be trapped in material bodies. And then it really would be hell on earth. All the spirit subjected to nothing but suffering. Okay, so that's a pretty wild interpretation to our ears. But it was very compelling to a lot of you know, profoundly intellectual people of the ancient world. This interpretation seemed to explain a lot of what went on. It made sense out of evil. Evil was simply the result of us not empowering our rational soul with the knowledge to resist what the flesh leads us to. And we go through our lives and we become forgetful of this. A baby firstborn seems to have this awareness, they would say. But as you grow up, you just kind of lose it because you're constantly bombarded with the sensations of the flesh. It's like going through life with like an IV dripping tequila directly into your blood system. That sounds fun for maybe a couple of hours or so, but constantly weighed down by this intoxicating thing, your rational mind just gets hammered by it and it shuts down. And that's what our lives are like. And especially think about how difficult it is when you're first growing up for children. You've got very little impulse control, very little discipline. You get in trouble. You do things you're not supposed to do. Then you go through puberty. Oh, my God. Then it really gets terrible for you. Guys, remember being 12, 13, 14 years old? Hormones raging. Girls around you starting to get their curves. And all you can think about is putting your hands on naked bodies. And you got no game, so it ain't happening. And you suffer. You want to achieve this and have this, and you can't get it, and you suffer. Everything is about trying to fulfill desires that are never really quenched. And yeah, it's great drinking a little bit of tequila, but you go over and do that, drives you to keep doing it. The next morning, you feel terrible. Even things that are pleasurable often lead to pain and suffering later on. So this is our lives. We go through this life with our flesh bombarding us with sensations that in the end just make us desire things we can't have and we end up suffering. That's the nature of life. And we eventually lose our rational focus. We lose our spiritual remembrance of where we came from and where we should be going. So the Gnostic writings all tend to use language like that. They talk about us being drunk and intoxicated and forgetful and not knowing we're trapped in these bodies and becoming more and more just like animals and forgetting the spiritual reality that is our true self. This body is just a dungeon. It's the spirit inside suffering that is the real self that needs to escape. And Gnosticism offers its adherents this knowledge. And then once you have this knowledge, the idea is that it should keep you focused on what's really you and then you can guide your behavior so that you can free your spirit. Uh, most Gnostics were vegetarians. They thought eating meat was, you know, by its very nature, gross, because you know, it's just more of that evil stuff down there. So they tend to eat light-colored vegetables, yellow squash and stuff like that. They thought it had a little more of the, of the light in it. Um, a lot of this comes from ancient Romans making jokes about them, so you got to read between the lines a bit. But remember, what makes a joke funny? There's a little kernel of truth in there somewhere. That's what makes it funny. So there's probably some kind of an echo of the real concerns of spirituality that these Gnostics had. Okay. Now, trying to really get you to wrap your head around the Gnostic universe is difficult because we've had thousands of years of living in a very different reality in Western culture, and this just sounds bizarre. Fortunately, however, in the modern world that you live in, many of you have seen a series of movies that is set in a Gnostic dualistic universe. Very popular movies, they're making the last few of them right now. A world in which there's a light and a dark side. 
that are equally powerful. And you got to be careful. Even though you seem good, you can be seduced by the dark side. And what is this movie series? Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. Exactly. When George Lucas wrote the Star Wars movie, he went to college. He learned stuff like this. He read Joseph Campbell's Hero of the Thousand Faces that helped him figure out you know, the plot and the action and the adventure. But he also learned about Gnosticism. And he thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a whole story set in a completely different universe than the audience actually lives in? And so he creates what is essentially a Gnostic world. So we have the light and dark side of the Force. And obviously, you'd want to be on the light side, but somehow people get seduced into the dark side. Now, when you first watch the movies as they were released, you're introduced to a villain called Darth Vader. And at first, he just seems like a stereotypical villain. He's all in black and everything, and he seems evil. But as the movies go on and the prequels come out, you suddenly start to get this other insight on him. He actually started off as little cute Anakin Skywalker, who loves his mommy and builds hover car racers and builds C-3PO. I mean, who saw that coming? Darth Vader built C-3PO as a kid, right? Mm -hmm. So we have all this background stuff. He was a nice little kid at first, right? Now, despite the you know, questionable acting of the characters that portray all this as he grows up, Still, what turns Anakin to the dark side? Emotion. Okay, so he's got this desire for Padme, who he can't have because she's above his station, so unrequited desires. What else? He wants to rise in the Jedi Order, but the elders are keeping him back, thinking he's not going to be able to handle it, so he has frustrated ambitions. Yeah. And the whole time, that Senator Palpatine is working him, lying to him, and manipulating his vision of reality to try to goad him in a certain direction. And the critical moment comes when Anakin comes in and he sees uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character about to run the uh, senator through, and in a, in a moment he blasts him out the window. All of a sudden he's converted to the dark side, because the very next scene you see him in, he's at the Jedi Temple, and they don't really show it, but they suggest what happens, he kills all these children. All the younglings are slaughtered. And the look on his face, he's not like evil or maniacal, it's, he's like a zombie. He's not himself anymore. He's been consumed by this dark side. Now the really problematic thing about all of this comes at the end of episode six, which is really the third movie that came out. Do you remember that final climactic scene between Luke Skywalker and the evil emperor and Darth Vader on the second Death Star? Yeah. Okay, so all of our other heroes are down on that Ewok planet having their you know, humorous you know, battles and stuff down there. But Luke realizes, ah, oh, they're tapping into me here. So Luke heads on up there to have the final confrontation. And the big problem is, as Luke goes in, how is he going to stop the Emperor? I mean, the obvious thing to do would seem to be is pop out your lightsaber, cut his head off, kill, kill the bad guy, right? Why can't he just do that? No, I'm talking oh, the Emperor. Oh, oh Emperor. Okay, yeah. sorry. Why can't you just kill the Emperor and be done? My guy can do it on time. Yeah. Because it would take him to the... What does that mean? That if he... The Emperor's goading him. He's egging him on, saying, yeah, go ahead. Give in to your rage. Do it. Do it. Why can't you just do it? Why can't you just harness his righteous rage and use it to kill the bad guy? That's what we expect our heroes and warriors to do across the millennia. When Bruce Willis is fighting 30 terrorists on the Yakutoba Tower in Die Hard, does he have to control his rage? <laughs> no! He harnesses his rage, goes, oh, give me Kai, hey, motherfucker, all these guys, and kills them all. And we're like, yeah! <laughs> but Luke can't do that. Because Luke lives in a different universe than we live in. It's perfectly fine for our heroes and warriors and crusaders to harness their rage and fight the bad guys. But Luke lives in a world where acting upon your rage, acting upon that, is in and of itself evil. It opens the floodgates, and the dark side, the dark force, the evil god, then subsumes you, and you become a creature of this. The really weird part is how Darth Vader meets his end. Luke, because he can't just go kill the guy, is kind of in limbo there, and the Emperor is like blasting him and killing him. Darth Vader's seeing this, and something awakens in him, and he's like, gee, that's my son. Y'all know Darth Vader's Luke Skywalker's dad, right? Yeah, it's yeah, kind of a spoiler. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, YouTube world, if I spoil that for you. You find out pretty early in the movies. 
and he decides he's got to do something. And so Darth Vader walks over to the Emperor, sort of calmly picks him up, walks him over to the trash chute, tosses him out and kills him. And then all the zappy power and stuff injures him to the point where he falls down and now he's about to die. So Luke has this final moment, he takes off his mask and, oh, gee, Dad, all that. Darth Vader dies. In the final scene of that movie, all the Ewoks and our heroes are on the planet playing bongos on stormtrooper helmets and stuff, and it's all a happy ending. And Luke, with his, you know, the force is strong in this one, he's able to see the spirit world, and he sees the glowing uh, semblance of Obi-Wan Kenobi, glowing green Yoda, and there's Darth Vader. Anakin Skywalker, glowing green, you know, mystically hanging out with the good guys there. Did that piss you off when you saw that? No. That is bull crap, man. Are you telling me Darth Vader doesn't have to go to hell? He doesn't have to get punished for his sins and die? What kind of theology is that? Darth Vader's been responsible for the deaths of tens of billions of sentient life forms across the galaxy. He blew up the entire planet of Alderaan. Alderaan chokes were everywhere. He does one good deed right before he dies, and he gets to glow green and hang out with the good guys? That's crap. Are you telling me if Adolf Hitler, like, saved a puppy right before he died, he wouldn't have to go to hell? <laughs> Nonsense. Adolf Hitler is responsible for the deaths of millions of people. He needs to burn in hell. We theologically need to believe that he's down there being punished for his sins, and one little good deed doesn't just get him out. <laughs> but Luke and Darth, they live in a different universe than we live in. They live in a universe where good and evil are equally powerful. And if you do evil things, it's not really your fault. You are simply not enlightened to the knowledge, the gnosis, that could have helped you guide your actions and save you. It's like you were just taken captive by it. You're a prisoner. And at the very end, Luke is able to save his father from the ship before it sinks. He rescues him at the last minute. But Anakin Skywalker, he's been a zombie the whole time. He's not responsible for his actions. And Luke saves him just in time. Or he would have been sort of extinguished in whatever realm of suffering. Imagine down there. So this gets us to why this is such a problematic thing. There's a lot about Gnosticism that is rationally satisfying as an answer to why there's evil in the world. The more you think about it, the more, it, in some ways, it kind of makes sense. If we would all just be rational and spiritual, there would be no suffering. It's because of our desires and the things we want and that cause other people to suffer, this is you know, what creates evil in the world. For the Gnostics, this is an actual tangible force. It's the nature of the material reality around us. That itself is evil. Whereas we're going to look at it a, a little bit differently as we'll see how Western society ends up figuring out the nature of evil. So think about this. If the church had gone with the Gnostic approach, that would mean that God and the devil are equally powerful. It would mean that there can be no judgment day. There's no judgment day at the end where everybody's going to you know, get their comeuppance and their reckonings for what they've done because it wouldn't be your fault. And you don't really need a church to administer sacraments and help you through life. All you need is the knowledge, and that's what frees you. And as the church becomes more wealthy and powerful, they're going to want to hold on to a structure that maintains their necessity. So there's a lot of reasons this simply wasn't going to work out. And it does sound kind of bizarre in many ways, but we ought not to reject uh, the Gnostics as just being wackos. A lot of really you know, high-level academics and intellectuals in the late Roman Empire, in, in the twilight of the ancient world, found in Gnosticism answers to some of life's deepest questions. And in fact, none other uh, a future Christian theologian than St. Augustine of Hippo who's probably after Jesus and St. Paul, like the next most important uh, thinker and shaper of where Christianity is going to go, St. Augustine began life as a classically trained pagan and then became a Gnostic Christian. He spent almost a decade going to Gnostic services. And then later he was converted when he met St. Ambrose uh, in Milan, he becomes an adherent of the Orthodox view. 
And Augustine is going to write many of the uh, arguments that the church will use against the Gnostics. In your uh, reader on your St. Augustine page, you have a little short quote there where you can see Augustine wrestling with this question. And he says, you know, I was contemplating the nature of evil and I came to understand that evil is not a substance. Evil is perversion of will. Turned away from the supreme substance, yourself, O God, and towards lower things. And when Augustine says evil is not a substance, we see that he's decided to reject this view. And the idea that evil is a turning away of your will, a willful choosing of lower things rather than divine things, that takes it back into orthodoxy, what becomes orthodoxy. And it now makes Judgment Day actually possible. You are now responsible for the decisions that you have made. Anybody recognize the, the flavor of that? The orthodox idea, which we'll talk about later, is essentially that we live in a material world that isn't evil, it's just a lesser reality. And that we ought to be focusing on higher things, on truer spiritual conceptual virtues, and that turning away from it just to pursue the material things of this world, that's what really evil is. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Like a Christianized view of a certain ancient Greek philosopher? It's Plato. You know Plato, the allegory of the cave. We live in a dim, shadowy world, but we got to find our way to true concepts. The early church is going to need some kind of a philosophical backbone uh, for its teachings, and it's going to find in Plato's philosophy something that is going to work well uh, with them, as we'll explore later. Okay. All right. So this is the Gnostic world. Now, the Gnostics have come to our attention uh, in the modern times because a lot of their writings were found. When the triumphant church became triumphant, it got rid of a lot of its enemies and competition. Uh, and so these other groups had to go underground, and the Gnostics were among them. So the triumphant church, you know, they found Gnostic writings and stuff, they would have burned these. By the uh, mid-fourth century, they've decided what's going to go in the New Testament. Uh, and the Gospels they've chosen are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? Matthew, Mark, and Luke you know, are your synoptic Gospels. But that was a foregone conclusion. They were definitely going to go into the New Testament. They're the earliest writings. They have the, the clearest memory of the ministry of Jesus. But John, that last one, that's an interpretation. It's a theological viewpoint Gospel. Jesus talks really differently than John. And John is going to end up working out for them but if the church had gone in a different direction, let's say the Gnostic Christians had become the dominant church, your Bibles might have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Thomas in them. Or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Gospel of Judas in it, for that matter. Remember, there's a dozen or so other Gospels, other early Christian writings that early churches had put together that are rejected by the official church once it decides what goes in there. And some of those writings were found in the 1940s in Egypt at a place called Nag Hammadi. And they are writings, uh, memories of the sayings of Jesus from a Gnostic viewpoint, from a Gnostic congregation. And these are fascinating writings uh, for a lot of reasons. For one thing, while we might have rejected this point of view in the Western world, these writings are also from people who lived a lot closer to the time of Jesus than we do. They were a lot closer to that memory. And so there could be you know, invaluable, insightful things there. And when you go looking through them, you'll find phrases and fragments that you recognize from the Synoptic Gospels. Things that are said in Luke shows up in the Gospel of you know, Philip and all these other ones as well. And then you also find stuff that's definitely not the stuff Jesus talked about. You find dualistic stuff, uh, the Gnostic kind of language, basically put on the lips of Jesus. But the exciting thing is this. Once you understand the historical context out of which these Gospels emerged, then you can start seeing some of the sources of this. The fact that there are passages in the Gospel of Thomas, for example, that we know from the Synoptic Gospels means that this group had a genuine connection to the memory of Jesus. They have a lot of the same stuff that's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They've also got some stuff in there that sounds like Paul's theology, but put on the lips of Jesus. So we know that whatever line of influence went to them went through Paul as well. Then we find when the Gnostics came in, they added some stuff to the words of Jesus that reflects their point of view, and so we can eliminate that. 
But then the great thing is that once you've done all that, and you've accounted for the stuff we know, the stuff that's false, the stuff that's Gnostic, there's a few lines left. There's a few passages here and there that sound like Jesus. It sounds like the stuff he used to say. But it's not known for many Gospels in your New Testament. And there's a strong argument that there are some genuine lost sayings of Jesus residing deep in those Gnostic Gospels. But it takes a little bit of academic uh, skill to weed out the other stuff and get down to that material. So we're going to turn to the Gospel of Thomas now. Uh, get that out in your readers. Remember that all Gospels are anonymous. We don't really know who wrote any of them. Um, but why would Thomas be an appropriate name to put on a gospel of people that are all obsessed with finding the true knowledge. What is the Apostle Thomas most famous for? There's really like one big story with him. Who is he called? My Sunday school graduates? What did Thomas do? Look at you. He's the doubting Thomas. Remember when Jesus emerges, he's the apostle that's skeptical at first? Until he touches the wound himself and sees, he's going to withhold judgment. So Thomas is this character. The one story about him is that he's most famous, that he wants to make sure he's not being tricked. He wants to make sure this is true. That's a very appropriate name to slap on this gospel. He didn't really write it. He didn't have an idea how this all came together. But uh, it's an appropriate name. Okay? So turn to the Gospel of Thomas now. Out there in YouTube land, I encourage you to go find the Gospel of Thomas and see what you can find in there. Some lost sayings of Jesus, perhaps. <laughs> 